A small number of cases or the tip of the iceberg. As three more members are suspended, we're looking at whether Britain's Labour Party has a problem with anti-Semitism. Also on today's programme, the clampdown on Crimea's oldest minority. We're looking at why Russia is calling the Tatar Assembly an extremist organisation. And in picture this, Jamie Vardy is having a party. Leicester City celebrate after defying the odds to win the Premier League. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. In the past week, Britain's Labour Party has been forced to suspend two high-profile members over allegations of anti-Semitism. The party's leader, Jeremy Corbyn, is seen by some as Britain's Bernie Sanders, a veteran politician far to the left of the mainstream. He was suddenly, and against all odds, thrust into the spotlight. His election brought 200,000 new members to the party, but critics say with that influx comes a growing problem of anti-Semitism. Corbyn says his party will hold an independent inquiry into the allegations, but the damage may already be done. Local elections take place on Thursday, and Labour is predicted to suffer its biggest losses for over 30 years. Today's newsmaker then is the British Labour Party, as we ask if it's got a problem with anti-Semitism. Go back and check what Hitler did. Go back and check what Hitler did. There's a book called Mein Kampf. It's a row that's ignited a civil war inside Britain's main opposition party. Many people would say your comments are anti-Semitic. Well, they're wrong. The former mayor of London and other Labour Party members have been suspended as the party is criticised over its attitude towards anti-Semitism. It is quite clear the Labour Party has got a problem with anti-Semitism. Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn says there isn't a huge anti-Semitism problem, but has promised new rules banning racism in his party. The uproar began over statements made online by Labour MP Naz Shah, including suggesting Israel should be moved to the US. It led to this apology last week. I accept and understand that the words I used caused upset and hurt to the Jewish community, and I deeply regret that. Anti-Semitism is racism, full stop. I think it is very simple. Anti-Semitism is effectively racism, and we should call it out and fight it wherever we see it. As the criticism mounted, Nashar was suspended from the Labour Party. But that didn't end the row, because Ken Livingston, the former Labour Mayor of London, then defended Nashar in a radio interview, saying this. Let's remember, when Hitler won his election in 1932, his policy then was that Jews should be moved to Israel. He was supporting um, Zionism, and his boy went mad and ended up killing six million Jews. His comments led to outrage. And you dare say, you dare say that Hitler supported Zionism. You're up, you've, you've lost it, mate. You need help. Labour MP John Mann shouted down Ken Livingstone after the interview. Factually wrong. Racist remarks. Go and check your history. The comments about Hitler led to a huge debate about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. We stand absolutely against anti-Semitism in any form. We stand absolutely against racism in any form. Anti-Semitism is wrong, full stop, end of story. I am sick and tired of people trying to explain it away. And yes, I'm talking to you, Ken Livingstone. Ken Livingstone was quickly suspended from the Labour Party, but refused to apologise. So are you sorry for mentioning Hitler? I wish I had Just say it. You wish you hadn't. And are you but sorry, I'm sorry. for apologise for telling the truth? Ken Livingstone is an old friend and left-wing comrade of Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn. But their party has been damaged. And with national elections just days away, much of the media focus is on whether Labour has got a grip on anti-Semitism. Duncan Crawford, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me to discuss the anti-Semitism debate surrounding the Labour Party, we have two guests out of London, Asa Winstanley, journalist at Electronic Intifada, and Paul Dreig Reedy, editor of Little Atoms magazine. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Asa, let me start with you. Which interpretation here is closer to the truth of, of what's going on? Um, criticism of Israel being used 
as a cover for actual hatred of Jews or principled supporters of Palestinians under occupation being smeared as anti-Semites. Which one's closer to the truth? What we're seeing in the Labour Party for the previous few months, and even going back to Jeremy Corbyn's uh, election campaign to become leader of the Labour Party, is a concerted campaign by the right-wing remnants in the Labour Party to get him out at all costs, teaming up with organisations that lobby for Israel in this country, and the right-wing media to get rid of them at all costs, to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn because he's a supporter of Palestine, he's a supporter of Palestinian human rights, he's a supporter of key elements of the boycott of Israel. And what my investigation, my article found on this was that some of the most high-profile cases and allegations of, alleg of anti-Semitism within the Labour Party are fabricated. I don't use that word lightly. I mean, actually fabricated. Uh, this actually, also, it didn't start just this week. It started in February with a student in Oxford with a sweeping allegations by a student called Alex Chalmers. Let me take higher profile cases then. Naz Shah saying, quote, the Jews are rallying. And then Vicky Kirby, Labour parliamentary candidate, saying Hitler was a Zionist god and tweeting, Jews have big noses, lol. Are those fabricated as well? It's the question as you posed there, it's not a case of either or. There's no doubt that there is anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, as there are in all um, sections of society. But there's no evidence whatsoever that the levels of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party are anything like as high as they are in the general society in the UK. Uh, reputable polling puts anti-Semitic views in the UK at about 7%, which you know is 7% too high, but it's lower than uh, Islamophobic views at, uh, I think it's about 19%, and uh, anti-Roma views, it's, I think, 37%. Um, so you would expect, in a party of 380,000 full members, like the Labour Party, you expect tens of thousands of cases of anti-Semitism, but instead we've got a handful okay. of allegations um, sure. which are being trumped up um, purely to sabotage Jeremy Corbyn in the elections this week. Okay, it's trumped up, it's just a handful. There's no evidence of widespread anti-Semitism. Padre Greedy? I think the allegation here is not necessarily that there is a widespread um, anti-Semitism within the Labour Party. The, the, the real problem is that the Labour Party does not take anti-Semitism very seriously. We've seen that in the past week. We've seen, you know, they have said they set up an inquiry and then immediately Diane Abbott, one of, um, one of Mr Corbyn's closest allies in the party, said that any claim of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party was a smear, thereby apparently negating the entire point of the inquiry. Then Mr Livingston you know, it, 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 you know, was able to go on the ring. That is exactly what she said. And, uh, it's, it's, I'm sorry, that is exactly what she, what she said. said. It was a smear. Now, she did not Mr. say any case you know, of anti-Semitism was a smear. Mr. She Livingston has a long... Mr. Livingston she has a long... She that. said that it was a smear in the Labour Party. Mr. I said, let me speak, please, let me speak. I know this is supposed to be a robust debate, but let me get to... Go ahead, Patrick. Now, you know, Mr., Mr. Livingston has a history of making offensive remarks about Jews. You know, he has a weird obsession, as, as Lord Sugar, the former Labour peer pointed out, he has a weird obsession with Hitler, with concentration camps, and with Jewish people. He called a Jewish reporter for the London Evening Standard like a concentration camp guard. Uh, he told two uh, Jewish property developers that they should go back to Iran and see how they get on with the Ayatollahs there. There's a, it, this, this thing keeps dripping and dripping. Yeah. And, and, Patrick, no one got to grips with yeah, it. Let, Corbyn, let me come you know, Corbyn told Naz Shah that she wasn't suspended sure. and then told her that she was suspended immediately afterwards. It, it, it is just a confused mess. Okay, you say it's and confused, Padraig. Let me come they in here. Spent, you say yes. they don't take it seriously, but then we have Shadow Education yeah. Secretary Lucy Powell saying quite clearly, there clearly is an issue with anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, otherwise we wouldn't have spent the best part of the last six or seven days talking about it. I think it's a very small element within the, mm. the Labour Party and probably a small element in wider society as well. And that's why we are taking swift action to root it out. So we have two senior members suspended. The Telegraph saying today that up to 50 members could have been secretly suspended. We can't verify that yet. They are taking mm -hmm. it seriously, aren't they, Padraig? 
They're taking, they're rather too late, I'm afraid. I mean, the, the, the real, the issue, where this is coming from is, is it comes from Mr. Mr. Corbyn and Mr. Livingston, Mr. McDonald's associations with the very hard, paranoid left of the 1980s, which was a hotbed of conspiracy theory. That was demonstrated earlier this year when a former uh, Workers' Revolutionary Party member, a current member of an organization called Socialist Fight called Jerry Downing, was allowed back in, into the Labour Party. He came from the same milieu as, as McDonnell and Livingston and Corbyn moved in the 80s, and he spouted the most horrendous conspiracy theories, which come from this core of the left, which the hard left, the revolutionary left, which has always had okay. A conspiracist core to okay, it. Okay, let's get let's get uh, Asa's response to that. The paranoid left of the 1980s. That's where this is coming from, Asa. Well, to return to a comment that uh, the other guest said, Diane Abbott absolutely did not say that any accusation of anti-Semitism was all cooked up um, by opponents of Jeremy Corbyn. She said there's Could an organised the campaign against years, Jeremy Corbyn, to jump in which is absolutely true. And uh, we can see that in, by whom? in the case Organized by of... whom, Esa? By whom? Name well, names, I already Esa. said it. I said the this? right wing, the right... I named them in my article, if you've read name, it. That's People like Wes Streeting and names. John Mann. Okay, uh, Padre, so give, give, John Padre give, 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 give Asa a chance. Wes Streeting and, 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 and John Mann are forcing Ken Livingston to say these things. All right, give Asa a chance. That's the problem here, Asa. What I showed yeah. in my article is that Wes Streeting, for example, who's a bitter opponent of Jeremy Corbyn, is being called on by the right-wing media to comment on all these false allegations saying Jeremy Corbyn's not doing enough, blah, blah, blah. And when in fact he's suspending people for mm -hmm. allegations hours after these allegations come out. So he is taking it seriously, even in my opinion, in cases which should not be taken seriously, like Alex Chalmers' absolute nonsense cooked up for his friends in the Israel lobby. It's completely farcical. Mm. Uh, John Mann, for example, who's so the Israel lobby you're saying is running this. That doesn't Ken, sound anti-Semitic at all. Do you, oh, Patrick, 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 do you, is, are you saying that Israel is the only country in the world that doesn't have political organisations that campaign for it? I mean, give me a break. What is this nonsense? Of course, of course not. there is. Of course not. Of, of, course, of course, it doesn't. Course Israel, Israel doesn't lobby, have organisations that campaign for it. The idea, the, the idea that it is. The, <laughs> <laughs> you're singling out what Israel. I'm say, what, I'm, what I'm saying. Why are you singling out Israel? I'm, no, you're singling out Israel. I'm, hang on, where where have you come from with this? I'm, what I'm asking is, do you seriously believe that the Israel lobby is somehow cooking up Naz Shah's stupid Facebook posts, Ken Livingston, you know, somehow forcing this stuff out in the open? It's there now. Political opponents will use it, obviously, but that's life. Can perhaps the Labour Party play the same game and and go and? Uh dig up the young Tories in the 1980s calling for Nelson Mandela to be hanged and call them all racist. Is that a political game being played or is there something real I'm, going on right now? You tell me. I'm sure, the, it, it, I'm sure they could. I'm, I'm, I'm sure if you, if you dug deep enough, you could, you could find thing, things, you know, the Conservative Party act of saying unpleasant things. There are two of them. Obviously, your opponents are going to use things against you. The right wing press you know, will attack the Labour Party or whatever ground it can. That's one issue. The other, but the point is you do not give them the ammunition. And the real problem here is that this stuff does exist. It's not being made up. It's not fabricated. It's, it, it is real. Ken Livingston's statement was real. Ken Livingston had refused 20 times on LBC Radio on Saturday to apologise for that statement. You know, these things are out there. They're not fabrications. And they must be dealt with urgently. And I suspect that Jeremy Corbyn's heart is not in dealing with this. Okay, Asa and Padraig, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you very much. So as we come on the Newsmakers, we're looking at the troubles facing Crimea's Tatars. And in picture this, Leicester celebrate one of the most unlikely triumphs in sporting history. It's been just over two years since Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula. The region's oldest inhabitants, the Crimean Tatars, were almost universally against it, having suffered mass deportations before at the hands of the Russians. Now the new authorities have banned the Tatar Assembly, calling it an extremist organization, a move one Tatar leader has likened to a declaration of war. The newsmaker Soraya Leni reports. 
There is division between supporters of Ukraine and supporters of Russia? Of course, of course, as everywhere, all over Ukraine. And even more in Crimea. Crimea is a multinational region and you can divide it endlessly. There are Karaites, Jews, Russians, Ukrainians, Tatars, Armenians. There are lots of different populations here. Indeed, there are. But human rights campaigners say one group in particular is being trampled on. Ethnic Tatars. Now, Crimea's Supreme Court has banned their governing body, ruling it to be an extremist organization. Amnesty International says the move demolishes one of the few remaining rights of a minority that Russia must protect instead of persecute. This is a long-held complaint of the Tatars directed at Russia and the pro-Russian elements in Crimea. An understanding from the Russian side is very important to us. We want for them to understand our love for our land and consider the fact that we do not have another homeland. We don't have another choice. They do. The people of Ukraine rose up in February 2014 and overthrew the pro-Russian government of Viktor Yanukovych. It sparked unrest in some territories, including Crimea. Yanukovych asked Russia to intervene. It did, and sent in troops who took control of the peninsula. Just two weeks later, the territory voted to join Russia as an autonomous state in a referendum that Ukraine and Western countries deem illegal. I'm here to give my vote for the referendum to be with Russia. The Tatars boycotted the vote. Why are they deciding for all the Crimean people, for all the nationalities living here? Where is Crimea meant to be? Part of the Russian Federation or Ukraine? Ukraine and Crimea is as one united. Those who did vote chose autonomy. The Tatars are a Turkic minority. They account for about 12% of the Crimean population. It wasn't always the case. Crimean Tatars used to be the majority, but in 1944, the USSR under Joseph Stalin ordered the removal of all ethnic Tatars from Crimea. They were able to return after the collapse of the USSR in 1991, but by then, the majority of Crimea's population was ethnic Russian. Tatars have long complained pro-Russian elements are pushing them out again. They say it's not just a struggle for a region, but for the identity of the Crimean Peninsula. Soraya Leni, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now to discuss whether Crimean Tatars are under threats is Emine Jepar. She's a Crimean Tatar herself and the first deputy minister for Ukraine's information policy. She joins me from Kiev. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Emine. Uh, Russia has banned the Mejlis. They deem them, quote, extremist. They blame the Mejlis for blockade and acts of sabotage. Is there any semblance of truth to the Russian claim? As a Crimean Tatar, as a social activist at my background, as a politician today, I know that it is really far from truth, all those uh, allegations that they put on Majlis saying that it's an extremist organization are really far from being truth. Because uh, by banning Majlis, they do ban Crimean Tatars as a, as, a, as a nation, as an indigenous people. So they are not allowing Crimean Tatars to exercise their rights according to that UN declaration for indigenous peoples, let's say. And I think that uh, a Majlis as a representative body uh, is a little bit more than just an institution for Crimean Tatars. So by banning it, they put a ban on even on a kitchen level by saying to everyone who lives in Crimea today that Crimean Tatars are social outcast uh, in Crimea. Yes, just looking at the Russian claim a little bit more closely, they claim Majlis leaders. Refa Chubarov, Lenur Islyamov, and Mustafa Jamilev used the Ukrainian Ultra Nationalist Association right sector to organize the food and energy blockade of Crimea. They also said 
that they blew up several pylons of the power mains that supplied electricity to the peninsula. Are, are all of those made up by the Russians? Uh, the thing is that those explosions uh, that Russian side claims to be done by Crimean terrorist activists is not proved yet. So we cannot uh, say for sure who did that. Uh, in terms of this blockade, uh, as Crimean terrorist leaders said uh, several times, uh, it was really public information that this blockade was done in order to uh, put um, to bring Crimea back in information uh, agenda, not only in Ukraine, but also outside of Ukraine. This was uh, a step which was done uh, in order to stop business between Crimea and all other parts. When I spoke to President Poroshenko a couple months ago, he was quite ambitious. He said he wanted to take back all of Crimea before the end of the year. He also has uh, a whole host of priorities on his agenda, right? He wants to end the war for good in the East. He wants to fix the economy. He wants to root out corruption within the Ukrainian government. Uh, as a Ukrainian government official, so putting aside the fact that you are a Crimean Tatar yourself, uh, putting that aside for the moment, as a, as a Ukrainian government official, where does the plight of the Crimean Tatar people really rank in terms of priorities? It's not very high up, is it? I wouldn't say so, because as far as I can uh, see that, the Ukraine does its best. Let's say there is a history when Crimean Tatars started to come back from the places of deportation 25 years ago. We have never had this kind of warm attitude towards Crimean Tatars. So officially, Crimean Tatars were uh, oosted out, like, uh, and, and, and officially lots of politicians here in Kyiv thought that Crimean Tatars are potential separatists and are dreaming of, let's say, reintegration in Ottoman Empire, which is Turkey today. And this attitude has really been changed since the annexation. If you ask me whether it's possible to bring back Crimea in one year, um, the response is that we never expected that the annexation is going to take place. And I, I saw that piece of your interview with President Poroshenko. He said if anyone asked him in 2013 whether it was possible that Putin is going to destroy all those arrangements of post-Yalta uh, period, no one could even expect that this could happen. So I think that's an issue that the world still doesn't have formed out or built up a vision of how to manage a uh, Crimean issue, of how to manage the war on the east of Ukraine, because uh, everything was done on purpose, because uh, Russia makes and provides smart politics. They annexed Crimea, then they started the war on the east, when you have a war, Crimea is not interested anymore. When you have refugees from Syria floating Europe, Crimea is not interested. It's not a secret because Europe is far, is much more interested in its own agenda. Refugees, Syrian war, economic crisis, uh, or are there any other issues. So this is all done on purpose and Russia knows that. And the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, leaded and captained by Lavrov, they are really walking out and, and they are playing with that card. Mm -hmm. Amina Jepar, unfortunately we have run out of time. Great pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us. In today's Picture This, the fairy tale has finally come true. Leicester City have been crowned champions of England after clinching the Premier League title for the first time. Let's take a look. difficult to beat, who play, who fight with the heart.
Today's newsmaker has been the British Labour Party as we asked if it had a problem with anti-Semitism. The party has had a massive influx of new members, 200,000 since Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader. And critics say this has led to the re-emergence of an anti-Semitic undercurrent in the party. But Labour says the number of cases is limited and it is working to deal with them. Either way, the attention has done little for the party's hopes going into this week's local elections. You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. As always, thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye-bye.